welcome to Running For Real, a global community with a shared love and curiosity for running. Together we reconnect with the reasons why we love to run and discover ways it helps us become better people. Whether it's the quiet moments of a morning run while the rest of the world still sleeps, or befriending the strangers next to you at the start line of a race. We are here to connect with others who see running as the common thread that weaves our lives together. Come join me, Tina Muir, as I talk with people from all walks of life, united by a love of running. Hello, my friends. Welcome to episode 307 of the Running Thrill podcast. Thank you for joining me today. I'm excited that you are here, excited you're going to get to go meet our guest today and this is going to be a fun one to dig into career paths. If you are interested in climate change, we are going to talk about some of those elements, but we primarily talk about running and the role that it plays in our life, uh, how it changes throughout our lives and how we can use it as a way of honoring people. Even if we at times feel like it might be a selfish thing to do, which you will hear me in this interview relieve myself of some of that pressure for the first time, the way my guest today puts this message, it really sunk into me. It hit me powerfully and I think it could for you too. I'm very excited to welcome Dr. Lydia Jennings to the podcast. She has a PhD in environmental microbiology. She is a runner who I have been following for many years now, really felt inspired by her. She is uh, the featured uh, athlete in Run To Be Visible, which is a Patagonia mini film. Uh, I definitely encourage you to check that out, but I want to let you hear more about that before we get to it. So without any further ado, let's go thank one of our sponsors and get right to the episode. Legacy of Speed follows the transformation of a San Jose State track program in the 1960s. What started out as a second tier state college no one outside of California had ever heard of, quickly became known as the home to Speed City. The guidance of one coach and his unconventional techniques launched the careers of the fastest sprinters of the day. Host Malcolm Gladwell, a competitive runner himself and former podcast guest on here, <laughs> traces the journeys of those sprinters who went on to ignite a boycott movement and protest the 1968 Summer Olympics. Malcolm talks to Olympic athletes, sports journalists, performance coaches and documentarians. And you'll hear from some of the best runners of all time, Tommy Smith, John Carlos, and Lee Evans. It's a story about athletes who dared to take a stand and the mentors who made them fast enough and brave enough to change the world. Find Legacy of Speed wherever you get your podcasts. Dr. Lydia Jennings, welcome to the Running For Real podcast. I'm excited that you're here. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here along with such esteemed guests you've had in the past. I'm just really honored to be part of your podcast list. So thank you. No, I'm excited to have you. And uh, I watched a few weeks ago, um, I was watching something where you were talking about uh, owning that doctor in front of your name, which is why I wanted to make sure I pronounced it. Is it starting to sink in yet that you you do have a PhD in environmental microbiology? Um and that's something that's tough, a lot of work to go into that, but do you feel like you're owning it now or does it still feel weird to say? Yeah, I think it still feels weird. Um, mm. And especially it depends on the different contexts. Like I think in emails, I'm used to seeing, seeing it, but when people say it in a life, especially people who've seen me go through this struggle, it took six years. So it is a really big time investment. Um, and I think when I hear people that, like, kind of reminds me of people who know and saw me before, prior. It kind of reminds me of that sacrifice and that recognition. Um, and like some people, like my brother, is like, "I'm not going to call you Dr. Jennings. You're always being my little sister." And I'm like, oh. <laughs> "So, yeah, it's it's a well, range of responses." One day he'll surprise you, and he'll be in an event, <laughs> be an event together, and he'll be like, "This is my sister. She's Dr. Jennings," and, and you'll be like. <gasps> Now I, now I really feel like it if you finally said it. <laughs> right, yeah. Family's always the toughest audience, I think, so. That's, that is very true. Uh, so, you know, environmental microbiology, I mean, that's very specific, I suppose. It's uh, probably something that's intense and requires a lot of science. So we will, we will go, 
I was just going to say we'll dig in, but as we were talking before this started, uh, Lydia called me out. Did I say dig in or did you say dig in? You said it. You said it. I said it. I don't even remember saying it, but we were saying dig in. And then she said, um, is that, uh, she said, that's a soil pun. Was it soil pun you said? Yeah. I said nice soil pun. (laughs) Yeah. And I, I was like soil plant, what's a soil plant? And then, and then, you know, I realized um, that that was what you said. So, um, <laughs> I nearly just said, let's dig in again, but we're going to go into, into some of that, into some of what you do and why that is so important for you. But I do want to start a little bit with, uh, running and how it ties in. Um, and I want to begin maybe with, uh, wings of America. Now this is a program that is important to you, um, is in some ways still a part of your life now. Um, and so maybe you could share with us uh, a little bit about your, your from your early running journey and how running was a part of your life uh, in high school and maybe even before that. Yeah. Um, so I grew up, I'm a citizen of the Pascual Yaqui tribe, which is based out of Tucson, Arizona. Um, but I grew up in northern New Mexico in Santa Fe. And so it's in Tewa lands. Um, really close proximity to the 19 um, pueblos of northern New Mexico, as well as Navajo. And so I went to an all native high school. And before I went into high school, my brother and sister had both been runners and I was much more of like a dancer at the time. And so um, as I was getting ready to go to high school, they're like, so you're going to run, right? And I was like, no, that sounds boring. And um, (laughs) they were like, no, you need to run. Like everyone in our family does it and we're good. Grandpa used to run. And I was like, uh, but pretty like once I was in, I went to a boarding school. And so once I was there, like running was one of the few ways to get off campus. And so I was like, okay, like I'll try this sport out. And it turned out that I really had a knack for it. And I just really enjoyed the community. And I had a really amazing coach, um, Edison Esquites, and he is the former director of Wings of America. And so he actually raised money for our school by like running the four sacred peaks of the Navajo Nation. And so I think he really just taught us about running as being kind of this whole, whole intention. So yes, it's physical. Yes. You want to be the fastest that you can be, but also it's like building relationship with the land and with the communities. Um, and it's, it can be a spiritual practice as well. And he kind of explained his process of it. And I think that was just really instrumental to framing my own work. And so we talk about Wings of America, and I think it's an important backstory because Wings of America was actually the way I got my first like running spikes was from Wings of America and like a donation from Nike partnership they had at the time. And so I kind of forgot about that. You know, I didn't, wasn't on any other national teams or anything, but I just had this coach who really talked about running this all encompassing way. And then as I went through college, I kind of lost contact with them. I ran my first year of college, um, but then I got injured. And I was actually coming back to grad school and I was back home in Santa Fe and I met the new director. We had some mutual friends, Dustin Martin. And, um, I was like, oh yeah, I remember wings of America. Like I had kind of forgotten about this group. And he was talking about all the different ways that he was taking the organization, which was just so inspiring and powerful. And so I think over the years I've been kind of um, watching with them. And, and he was really interested in how I was connecting running with my science. And so they have a coaches camp, which he invited me to come out and kind of speak to the students and the um, coaches who are becoming coaches in their own community about what I was doing. And, and just this, this piece of like science of, of running um, is a, a lifelong friend. And that's, that's how, how I see it as running as this lifelong friend that you ebb and flow in the different uh, stages of your life but running is kind of the central piece of you. Right. I I call it like my best relationship with myself. Um, Mm, and like every relationship you have your ups and downs. (laughs) And so, uh, we were kind of talking about that, but also it's because I was injured in college that I actually really fell in love with science. Um, but it's also been like through my own graduate program that, um, I was able to have running as a really important part of keeping my mental health and my physical health sane. And so we were just kind of talking about that relationship with running. And uh, I think we really just aligned in the, and kind of how we see running as a tool to so many other bigger parts of our life, whether that's environmental activism or scholarship or being present in our communities. And so over the years, Dustin is like, you know, we have this program of taking people to run the Boston Marathon and fundraising for students. And would you be interested in doing it? And it was always at like very hard times in my PhD. Like I'm, I'm getting ready for comprehensive exams. Like, no, I have this and this. Like, I just can't. Oh, I'm trying to finish up my dissertation and graduate. And so finally, actually this April in 2022, 
um, I feel like things aligned and he offered again, like, would you be willing to come out? It's going to be the 50th year of the woman running and running the Boston marathon. Would you be able to come out? And I was like, yes, I have to say net yes now. Cause I don't know what's happening next in my career that I might not have that flexibility. Um, and my, my postdoc advisor, I'm, I'm a postdoc now, I should say <laughs> at the university yep. of Arizona, she's also a runner and was really supportive. And then I think a piece of that was like, well, I want to tie it to my own scholarship and like thinking about how the whole foundation of, of running for me and, and this relationship with Wings of America has come about. You run for more than just yourself. You're running to raise money for others, which is what I was doing at, at the Boston Marathon was raising money for the Wings of America program. But just thinking about this really interesting way that this program has come into my life at really important places. Um, exactly, yeah. Yeah, has been just really have been really beautiful. So I ran yeah, the Boston Marathon is. in April, and that was just an amazing experience. Yes, yes, and we will, and we will probably go into that a little bit later. Um, I didn't get to see you that day, but I, I was very aware that you were um, you were there, and uh, was excited to see you know that you you did it um, afterwards. So um, we will dive into that um, in a little bit later. I want to a few things. One, I. Um, I want to, I want to be the, this is me being running for real, uh, for my listeners. I hadn't thought about this before, but you mentioned it. And so I want to kind of ask about it, but if I'm being insensitive here, please, um, correct me, say whatever you need to say. Um, you mentioned there that you went to a boarding school. Um, there's obviously been a lot of negativity around boarding schools, especially, um, with people from indigenous, indigenous communities, um, with, you know, what has happened, the, um, children that were sent there, what the horrific things that happened to them. Tell us about like, was this, uh, was this kind of a, a, a different situation in terms of this? You said you went to a native school. So, um, mm -hmm. tell us about what that was, what that was like for you in terms of that. And then learning about, um, boarding schools, other boarding schools that maybe weren't, uh, native people run, uh, if I'm wording that correctly and, uh, how that felt to know that that could have been a situation that you could have, you know, found yourself in at some point. Yeah, that's such a great question. And I really appreciate the awareness um, because it's something I've been thinking a lot about as all of these bodies have been covered at different mm -hmm. federal government or Catholic style of boarding schools. Yeah. And my own reflection and relationship with my boarding school, which was an indigenous run boarding school. Um, it was in Pecos, New Mexico. It's, still, it's closed now, but it was founded by this publisher, the Edinger Publishing house, which published a lot of history books. And I think mm. the publisher, when he retired with his wealth, he was like, I have seen from history how painful it's been to Native people. And I want to help support wow. Native people however I can. And so he started this boarding school that was primarily a board of, of by Native people. The majority of the teachers were Native people. I was trying to pick the outstanding students in different communities and have them come together and then design the curriculum. And so my experience at the boarding school was really positive. Um, I think a lot of everyone, you know, it was small. It was much smaller than these typical government boarding schools. Mm -hmm. um, and I felt like a lot of the people that I made friends there, I'm still friends with today. But it was, I was like also very fortunate that I was close to home. It was only an hour from home versus some of the students that we had who were like from South Dakota and um, really struggled with that. And so I think, um, there is a piece of that, like everyone brings in their own historical family traumas and issues into a place like that. And so it can, depending on how things are for you, it can be really positive and really negative. Um, mm -hmm. and it's, no matter what, like you're going through a, an era, you know, your teenage years that are really hard. Um, mm -hmm. And so there are definitely ways I'd see that program, that school could have been better. And in other ways it could have been worse. Um, I think that one of the positive things is that most of the students that graduated from that college, some went on to start their own indigenous school um, in Albuquerque, mm -hmm. the Native American Community Academy. Uh, there, many of them I, I like professional colleagues today in, in indigenous law and indigenous science and academics um, oh. or working within tribal government. So I think like in my experience, it was really positive and, and we fostered a big sense of community because we were away. But also recognizing, and this is something I remember talking about, you know, that history of like why our families were really hesitant to send us to this school. Yeah, sure. Um, because recognizing how harmful 
Indigenous boarding schools have been to our families, how much trauma there is associated with that. Mm. Uh, and so as many of these bodies have been uncovered more presently, reflecting on how different my experience was and almost feeling like a survivor's guilt because it was, yes. for me, it was such a positive space, but knowing that like, that is such a, a very small statistic, right? And and also I think for me, it recognizes that indigenous led is really the future and it, need, it should have been the past, but it really is, is the future. It's like, we can have very positive, we can take something that has so much trauma, but when it's indigenous led and there's that cognizance and awareness, it can be a really place of beauty. Um, and that unfortunately is not the case in many indigenous boarding schools. Yeah. Well, thank you for, for sharing that with us. I know, as you, as you mentioned, while your experience was positive, there obviously is a lot of trauma there and I appreciate you opening up in that way. And, um, and actually I wanted to go on, you know, you said about, um, the future is, um, indigenous led and, um, I want to talk about that in terms of climate, uh, how many, <laughs> things now people are realizing like, oh, you know, we should, we should learn from these indigenous communities. And it's like, well, yeah, I've been saying that all along, you know, <laughs> we have the solutions, have things that work through, uh, that work that will help us with this changing climate, but we'll get to that in a little bit. Before we go to that, I want to continue just on the running a little bit more. You mentioned about your coach, how much of a powerful, positive influence he was. I am curious though, with coming into the sport in that way, in a very holistic, grounded, literally grounded way of, um, you know, giving back, um, connecting with the land. You, ha correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm assuming there hasn't really been a period of, of your life, or maybe there has, where most kids who get into running, at least here in, uh, you know, the global north in the US particularly um and the UK that I know um come into the sport with that like you got to win you got to perform you got to do your best you got to get this and just coming at it from a different aspect whereas you from the start were given this very healthy approach to running have you ever been sucked into that i've always wondered if someone started in the right way would they get still get sucked down that performance path Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, so like yeah. I said, I, I ran in high school and then I ran my first year of college, you know, in high school, you're a strong runner. All of us experience that, that phase where you go to a bigger pond and then you're not the big fish or the fastest <laughs> fish. Right. Um, and so I definitely felt that when I ran in college, like it was pushing yourself. It wasn't a good run unless you were like vomiting at the end, right? Like that kind of <laughs> coaching mentality of like, you have to push yourself and be the fastest and like not listen to your body. Um, and it became less about like me and that relationship I have with the land and with my teammates and more about like being the fastest and constantly thinking about your competition and how you like play the, play the mind games of like running and being competitive. And it was really exhausting for me. And it kind of became where like, I didn't appreciate running. I started to become, it became all consuming. And I kind of became a little bit like resentful of like how much I was sacrificing in that respect of other pieces of being of a normal, like 18, 19 year old, um, in order to be like, to, to earn my place on the team, right. To hold my place. Or if I lost my place and like really being hard on myself or thinking just about my diet too, of like, Oh, if I like I, I ate too many M&Ms, so now I'm like not going to be as fast, all of those pieces. And so when I got injured and, you know, I, I was on a running scholarship, so I had to either pay and I was in, in Canada. So I had to either pay like international student tuition or figure things out. Like I left and then I came back home and I felt like such a failure. Um, and I think that piece is, is, is really important to talk about. Right. Is like, I feel like so often we push high school athletes, like, yeah, your life, your whole life is your athleticism, but what happens when you get injured? Um, and so that's something I often talk with, with native youth about is like, you have to make sure you have other parts that fill you up and, and make you feel like a whole person. Because if this one piece, if something happens, which like, it's very high, it's highly statistically, it's very highly to happen. Then like, who are you going to be? And like, what are the other skills you have? I think like as an indigenous person, we're always reminded that like we have community Our community, we're a part of a community. And so I think that was what I really leaned into. 
and then leaned into the science within that. But I think it can, it was, it was really hard regardless um, of figuring out who I am if I'm not a runner. Yeah. That's, that's very interesting. Cause I really, I mean, I guess that shows the power of being put into a situation where a culture is, I mean, you had the lessons from the start that would have been ingrained in you, but then, uh, as you said, at the end of the day, you're still a teenager and teenagers are swayed by the people that are around them during that time. Did you, were you still that connection to the land? Did you still, were you aware of that? Even when you would go for a run with your team, were you still kind of quietly thinking that in the back of your mind or did it just completely get pushed out? No, I think more, it's like, I appreciated doing like the trail workouts, like longer, longer runs and like trail runs versus like track workouts. Like that's, mm -hmm. that's like really yeah, where you're sure. like pushing it hard. And so I think like, I recognize that difference, but like, you're still in this environment to basically conform and, and compete. And so mm -hmm. I needed to stick it out in that environment. Right. Um, and I think it was really like, I don't know if I would have come back to running, and like racing again, if it hadn't been for like a boyfriend in my last year of college where, so I got injured my, my first year and then just kind of really leaned into my science. And then my, my senior year, I was still running, but just like casually around campus. And my last year, my boyfriend at the time was really into trail running and backpacking. And so he was like, yeah, we should just do this trail run event. And I was like, well, I'm a runner. And like, he didn't, he didn't grow up as a runner. Like let me see. And like for a while, he was a little bit faster than me. And that competitiveness came up I'm like, I got to be faster. <laughs> and so, and then after he and I broke up after college, then I think there was like a piece, a little bit of a petty piece where I was like, okay, now I got to be better than him at running. And then I really opened up this whole world of trail running in a way that I didn't know existed. Um, and that, and like, and doing more longer distance running, which I, I appreciated a lot more than some of those faster workouts. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you for sharing that. And, um, you know, I'm obviously glad that that happened because it led you back into that, that led you, led you to this moment right now and, uh, allowed you to find that healthy approach and, and perspective towards running again. I, I think it was in, uh, run to be visible, but I either read or, or remember you saying about how typically running is seen as a, a selfish personal pursuit. Um, and as someone, you know, I had many years as a professional slash elite runner and I definitely felt that so strongly. And I still do, you know, feel that when I, uh, take time out for myself that I'm being selfish, but you've talked about, you know, running for community, embracing the joy that you have a body that can run running for others and, and honoring them in that way, almost like a ceremony. Um, that's what, you know, I read, I think it was in run to be visible. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. We yeah. said that was like one of the, uh, the first quotes in run to be visible, which actually got okay. a lot of like interesting reactions in some of like the YouTube comments and stuff. So <laughs> about that specific part. Yeah. About that. They're like, like, especially in the pre, when the trailer came out and that was like yeah. one of the first things we talk about is people like some people like really leaned into like, yeah, I run for myself. Like, why should I be sh shamed about that? And other people were like, we all run for the community. As I was just really interesting to see the range mm -hmm. of reactions to like what I, you know, I think it's different cultural um, experiences with what that individualism versus community means. But yeah, it was just really interesting to see those reactions. Although you break the cardinal rule of the uh, 2020 times, which is to read the comments. Um, I know. I thought <laughs> I was really, I was really nervous before run to be visible yeah, came out. Sure. I was so nervous. Like I didn't sleep the night before uh -huh. because it's so scary to put that much of yourself out there on the internet to be consumed and judged. Um, yeah. And that has been a, a really, I mean, I've been very fortunate, like Patagonia and the filmmakers were really like mm -hmm. making sure that, um, I was protected I, I, in some ways because it came out on on Indigenous Peoples Day or Christopher Columbus Day, and so some people were really like angry just about that. Oh, piece. like fired up, yeah, yeah. yeah they're yeah. like Columbus was running for like or sailing for a community. I don't know, like weird things like that. Yeah. <laughs> but I think those were like quickly taken down. But of course, I looked. <laughs> but you're yeah, not yeah, supposed no, to do. It's, I know it's almost impossible not to. It's it's really hard not to. Okay, so just for anyone who doesn't know, what is Run to Be Visible? Just so you mentioned that there. Yeah. Um, so Run to Be Visible is a short film, about 18 minutes, that was produced by Patagonia. 
um, and the Rising Hearts founder, Jordan Daniels. And um, it, yeah, she's been on the podcast. And it's basically, I graduated the class of 2020. My graduation was canceled. I didn't know, I had to fight, figure out a different way to celebrate. And so I decided to run 50 miles along the Arizona trail, but also along an area that I had studied extensively through environmental impact statements and uh, different reports about this mine that was going to, was potentially going to go in this area, which may still go in this area. Uh, and so I ran 50 miles, but I wanted to dedicate each of the miles to different indigenous scientists who inspired me and raise, I raised a little under $10,000 for um, scholarships for native students whose education was impacted by COVID-19. So that's like the, the, the grand summary, but it talks, the film itself talks a lot about mining issues within the Sonoran Desert and also how they impact Indigenous people um, about my run. And we have a list of 50 Indigenous scientists who kind of inspired my work. And I think it's really important to mention that piece because at the time in 2020, when we are, there are all of these really critical conversations happening about who are our heroes, um, who are the founders that we celebrate in our fields of study, which are typically like old white men, but there have been many Indigenous scholars who have contributed throughout time to the theories of science. And many times they've been co-opted by some of these same um, old white men that we celebrate. And so I really wanted to create, and there wasn't at the time any kind of resource of indigenous scientists. Um, and so I wanted to create what didn't exist at the time and also be able to think of the past, but also build for the future. And that's the part of the piece of raising money for future indigenous students who are struggling um, I myself supported myself through undergrad with a lot of waitressing and bartending. And so had we had the big lockdown and I wouldn't have been able to continue on in college. So I thought that about that piece a lot as well. And so Brand to be Visible is on YouTube. Um, if you want to check it out, I'd appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you to Paceline for sponsoring this episode of the Running For Real podcast. The Paceline card is the first credit card with cash back powered by your workout data. Yes, that means your runs. Now, I just want to say, even if you aren't running right now, even if you're injured or something is meaning that running is not in your life, anything that gets your heart rate higher than a brisk walk counts towards your 150 minutes. When you hit 150 minutes, you will get up to 5% cash back on health and wellness purchases like your running fuel and your gear. Terms and conditions apply so you can find out more at paceline.fit. But Paceline believes you should be rewarded for being healthy. And people who are physically active for about 150 minutes per week have an estimated 33% lower risk of all-cause mortality, basically any kind of death, than those who are not active. That's good for you and good for the world. And I want to just mention some of the some of the places where you can get up to 5% cash back. So Trader Joe's, Whole Foods, REI, where we get our running gear, all those purchases, we can get up to 5% cash back. So you can apply for the card by getting more out of your miles by going to download the Paceline uh, app from the app store that you use and use code TINA. You will apply for the card. If you are accepted, you will be able to get that up to 5% cash back. Join me. I am not someone who has a lot of credit cards. I am actually very picky uh, about which credit cards I get. I have very few, actually, I'll be honest. I had two. Now I have three. That's all I've ever had in my life. I really have, am picky about these and I love this one. I love that just running is giving me that extra bonus. And by the way, there's 3% cash back on everything else. Plus card members can get reimbursed uh, for the latest Apple Watch if you want to use that. And this app works by connecting with your Apple Watch, with your Garmin, uh, so that you don't have to do anything other than logging into the app. So start getting more out of your miles, literally, by applying for the Paceline card today. Make sure you use code TINA when you download the app from the App Store. Go check out paceline.fit for more. Yeah, I'll, put, I'll definitely put a link in the show notes and recommend it. I, I remember seeing it as soon as it came out. I really loved watching it. Uh, yeah, uh, Jordan's a friend and uh, just does amazing work. So that was um, really cool to see it. And I encourage everyone to go watch it if you haven't already. Uh, 
Patagonia kind of speaks for itself that <laughs> they they would make something that was uh, excellent quality and it really is. So going we'll go into some of the elements of that. I want to go back to what we were saying about it being selfish versus running beyond those endeavors. Uh, we talked about how you kind of got sucked into that mindset of, you know, that it essentially is a selfish thing. I'm doing it for myself, my performance. What is it? Can you just elaborate on that a little bit more for us now, uh, now in terms of, um, seeing it as a selfish pursuit, as you mentioned, is what most people view it as. What would you say to maybe not convince them otherwise, but just to share your perspective on why it can be more than that? Yeah, I think running for community, that piece really stems from my own indigenous background and also learning from other indigenous nations. Um, so there's a lot of tribes, particularly in Arizona, that host different community races. And part of it is to recognize that our communities have really high and disproportionate rates of obesity and diabetes. And so having these community runs that you go and you compete and you do your best, but at the end of the day, like you have some, you're like, oh, like us Yaki beat these tri this tribe or we're like in Hopi lands, but we're going to beat the nap, you know, just like that kind of stuff. So recognizing the different nations that you represent and the families that have, some of the families have really long legacies of being runners. And so that's a big point of like pride for yourselves, for your family and for your, your people. But the other piece that I've seen that I really have loved to see and learn from the Thana Atham Nation, a, a tribe in the Sonoran Desert, um, is how they will show up to non-tribal races as a team together. And they will all stand as each person comes across the finish line, they will stand and clap and wait for their other teammates to come through. And they will wait till the very last person comes to celebrate. And so in that way, I think they really represent a great physical representation of that running for a community and finishing, starting together and finishing together, which I love. Um, but I, I think also in general, as Native people, when we're often in um, many running spaces, even though we have very long histories of being runners, we're not well represented. And so I think that there's that other piece of rep running for community and that capacity of representation. And then also running for community in the, in the way that I've done races and runs and you have elders who are sitting by the finish line and they thank you for running because they can't do it anymore. Yeah. And so I really think about that piece too. And like, or, you know, and I was at Wings of America with these, these 16, 17 year olds and they were running so fast in times I could never envision. I'm like, run for me because I can't run that fast anymore, you know? <laughs> and so I think that piece too is just recognizing that each step that we take, there's all of these people who, and people who've supported us to get to the place where we can take those footsteps. And so I think that's the part that I really carry within me is, it's all of the people, it's even all the non-human relations that have helped support me, the lands that I run with, um, my dog who supports me, you know, the foods that I eat, the animals that have sacrificed themselves so that I can eat and be strong in the way that I am today when I run. And so I think that's what I think about is it in a much more holistic capacity. I love that. And actually, even I mentioned to you that I'd always felt, and I've said this so many times um, on this podcast and beyond about uh, when I was running as an elite, feeling selfish, feeling like my family, my friends, everyone had to navigate their lives around mine, which they did to, to help me to be my best. But I had never thought of it in the way of, did I know when I was running my best and accomplishing something that they were experiencing joy? Yes. But could I view it as I was doing it for them partly to, because they don't have that ability to be able to do that? I'd never considered that. So, um, I love that way of thinking and that actually, I feel like that's given me a bit of a like lift off my shoulders and, um, hopefully I'll stop saying how, um, damaging I think it was because you're right to them. They did get to experience what that was like through me. So, um, thank you for giving me a small piece of, uh, redemption. <laughs> um, <laughs> I do love the community piece that you mentioned there. And I feel like we're starting to see more of that in the, in, in the greater running community, people recognizing the power of, um, coming together, particularly after COVID to, uh, or I guess we're still in it, but, um, how much we missed one another being around other runners, be seeing other runners, um, 
getting to just be surrounded by people who you're doing this um, as a collective. So I hope that that message will continue to to seep through um, to, you know, everyone in the running community, because it does feel better when we're doing it um, together and, you know, finding that way to um, celebrate our bodies for what they can do for those who can't, as you mentioned. Um, yeah, I think I saw a really great example. I mean, I think for me, that became that notion became so much more mainstream with the death, the murder of Ahmaud Aubrey, right? Yeah. The black runner um, in, I think it was Georgia, and mm-hmm. and so many other people, runners. And I think that's really important, like work in organizing um, by a variety of black runners to, to increase that awareness. But I think it was a really important critical point for a lot of other runners who don't who aren't black to really recognize that this thing this sport that you always say is so accessible and so safe isn't for so many and i think it gave a lot of space for women to speak up more which they have been but like it was like well look there's all these intersectional issues that i would talk about in terms of why we have to be run, running safer and recognizing that like as we run many women are right run, running for missing and murdered indigenous women like jordan or for the children boarding schools or just it became like i think or running for other black murdered people or asian hate crimes like i think that we just saw such a jump and increase of awareness about like running isn't safe for everyone and this is how this thing that i love to do that makes me feel good is also a really f- powerful tool to increase awareness absolutely yeah we've had multiple people on the podcast to talk about this um and uh, recently Dio Cato came on, he's using, uh, running as a form of protest. And that was a, another really powerful one of a, you know, reminder of exactly what you, what you just said there. So thank you for that. I have a lot, I still want to ask you about, but I do want to take a moment as, uh, everyone knows who listens to this regularly that I am very passionate as are you about, uh, sounding the alarm about climate change, letting people know about protecting our environment. Can you tell us a little bit about, again, in Run To Be Visible, but beyond that, in what you do in your career, um, mining? You mentioned mining a little bit there. What are some of the things that people may not know um, that you would like to share with them about that? Yeah, so I study mining and mining reclamation um, generally, I, but I, or I would say specifically and more broadly, I study soil science. And so I guess in thinking about mining, um, Arizona, where I come from, is the largest copper producer in the United States. Um, we need copper in all of our electronics. It's the best semiconductor that exists. All of our discussions towards renewable energies are going to require copper. And so I like to always point out in this that when we talk about sustainability, we have to recognize and reflect on sustainable for who. Um, being an indigenous person, many tribal nations still don't have clean water or running energy, even though, you know, so much coal has been produced from them, so many metals have been extracted from them, extracted from them. And so I think that is a really important framework is that we talk about these just transitions. We also have to make sure the people are part of that just transition. Um, And part of that means listening to tribal nations. So another piece of my work is really on tribal consultation and how tribal nations should be leading and guiding these conversations about what just transition means. Um, also be, I think a big piece of the, all of this discussion that often is left is, is left out of the conversation is how we need to be reducing our energy consumption. And many nations have been doing that for a long time. We are not the primary consumers, but we are the primary producers of those metals of interest. So that's just a little of my spiel. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you for that. And um, you also talked about uh, when you mine a pound of copper, 99% of you said 99 I can't remember the exact thing you said 99% of what is mined is waste correct is rege- yeah it's rejected as waste and so we have to figure out yeah. ways to restore our ecosystems um in cost efficient capacities and you know I live in the Sonoran Desert so we are in the middle of a drought um it's going to be those kinds of droughts are going to be increasing glo- um, globally and so this question of like how to restore those ecosystems as quickly as possible, uh, as easy as possible, but also that maximizes that potential is a really important research question. And by studying in my area, a mine that was leased from a tribal nation. And so because it was leased from a tribal nation, 
they had a lot of authority to control how that was reclaimed. And so they chose to invest more than the mining company would typically do, but they chose to invest in a couple of different options that actually made it one of the best reclaimed sites in the state of Arizona. And so I think that to me shows that really the power of when you braid together um, indigenous knowledge systems and typical science metrics. So with that, that, uh, you know, weaving together of indigenous people with, uh, what, you know, society needs, what, uh, I guess the state we have found ourselves in here, you have also found some, some positive things that, uh, or discovered these things that actually give us a lot of hope. There's a, a lot of doomism, a lot of negativity, a lot of, well, we're screwed. So what's the point? But in what you have found with your work, there is a lot of resiliency res within that ecosystem, even though there's been a lot of damage, a lot of trauma. Uh, so just tell us a little bit about that, as I think it's quite good to, for us to hear that and to feel that there is hope. Yeah. So one thing I love to point out with the word resiliency, as, a, as an Indigenous soil scientist in my work, I have found these the words resiliency in both soil science and in Indigenous epistemologies or indigenous studies, which I always found really interesting. And so in soil science, we talk about resiliency in this capacity for an ecosystem to be able to recover. And it recognizes that the ecosystem isn't going to be the same as it was prior, but it's still, it can serve the same functional roles and that it really best addresses above and below ground plant dynamics, for example. And in indigenous studies or in American Indian studies, we talk about resiliency in terms of cultural resiliency. So recognizing how a community has this adaptive capacity despite colonization or land degradation, and that resiliency helps rekindle these relationships and importance of place and of culture and of knowledge. And so for me, I think studying resiliency in the context of ecosystems has been so powerful because there is this idea of we want to heal the land, but it's never going to be the same as it was. Just like us, if we get injured, we might not ever be the exact same, but we're going to get as close as approaching as possible. Um, but I think the piece of like the cultural resiliency and being able to bring and rebuild relationships and strengthen those in some capacities um, and learn them in new ways is so powerful. And so in my work, it has been looking at how plants are recovering. And in some places, they recovered better than the natural desert ecosystem. Um, and then also the tribe being the Tana'atam Nation Environmental Department being so critical critically important in selecting what plants are going to be there to best adapt to the changing climates, to this new ecosystem, but also in envisioning what they want their future lands to be like, um, even though they've been gone through the most intense degradation that is caused by mining. And, I, and so I think that piece to me is really powerful is as we think about how we can be climate resilient, it's also envisioning what is the future world that we want and how can we take that knowledge of the traumas, but also of the benefits and the ways that we've over, overcome things um, to really serve in that capacity? Thank you to Allbirds for sponsoring this episode of the Running For Your podcast. Now, you heard Tim Brown, the founder and CEO of Allbirds, just a few weeks ago. I absolutely love talking to him, getting a bit of insight into where all birds came from. So cool. If you did miss that one, be sure to go back and check that one out. Now, Tim and I got to meet when we were at the press event for the tree flyers, which I want to tell you a little bit about today. So you can go faster and further with this new tree flyer. They are lightweight. They are super springy. And yes, I can attest to this. I've done one ultra. I've done two marathons. I've done a half marathon, a 10K and a 5K in these shoes. I love them. They are wildly comfortable, uh, even though I did that ultra and it was 95 degrees, they kept me comfortable. This distance running shoe is going to make your extra efforts feel effortless. It has this Swift Foam, which is this new technology, this high performance midsole that is big on cushion and energy return, making those longer runs like what I did a lot easier on our body. They have an external heel counter, which by the way, is made of the waist from the midsole, which is so cool. Uh, and flare geometric midsole that's going to help keep your stride steady. They are lightweight, they are breathable. The um, upper is made of eucalyptus fiber, which is really cool. Um, and these shoes are just fantastic. I've really enjoyed using them. I love that they are made from, uh, there's a lot of natural materials in there and including a natural rubber, which make sure by the way you look up what natural rubber means. And they are just 
my favorite shoe right now. I'm wearing them often. You will see me in them all the time. And you, my friend, can go to allbirds.com to go check them out. They have men's versions. They have women's version. If you have an Allbirds near you, go check them out there. You can see them in person, try them on and see what you think. Also, I haven't even mentioned yet, my favorite uh, feature is that they can slip on and off. You don't even need to, to untie the shoes to take them off, which I love. Go to allbirds.com to find out more. I've heard you talk about, uh, you don't have kids right now, but you've talked about how you want to be able to tell your children and grandchildren you did all you could to protect the environment. Now, I don't think this necessarily has to apply to children. If someone listening doesn't have children, has no, you know, is not going to have children, that's, a, that's absolutely fine. In general, though, there is uh, a lot of um, fear for the future uh, and what it will look like. I'm just curious with you, as this is a passion of yours, this is your career, this is something so integral to who you are. I really struggle at times, I've mentioned this a lot, with letting go of what I can control. Um, having, having ha as I have a two-year-old and a four-year-old, I am so aware of living, as you mentioned, doing all I could. It starts to drive you crazy after a while when you start trying to control every little detail and knowing that in the, in the, the reality is your little changes you're trying to make aren't really changing anything at all, at least in the day-to-day -day things. How do you handle that when you're in this day in, day out? It's your work, your career, your um, you know, upbringing and what you believe fundamentally. How do you, how do you let go of that? Yeah. Well, I think this is why I run a lot <laughs> is like, I need to have that practice of self-care. Right. But I also think just being an educator and I, yeah, I don't have kids right now, but one of the things I love in, in teaching is kind of planting those seeds of hope in students. And so for me, I think about how I was trained to be a scientist and the, what I'm bringing to kind of in teaching to fill the gaps that I often felt and, I, and then I see how students respond to it and how thankful they are and how that begins to grow their own branches and trees. And I think it's just so powerful. When I talk to students who are in the same phase I was in high school, they are just like leaps and bounds ahead of me. And they have to be, honestly, because they recognize these barriers and these hindrances, of the, this burden that they're carrying, this environmental burden that they're carrying. But they are just so like so far ahead of so many adults. And like I am still kind of in that in-between phase, but I just think that that piece, even like middle schoolers who are just so cognizant of like environmentalism, of the climate justice, of intersectionality, like all of that just makes me feel so hopeful. And so I guess it comes back down to this piece of like, yeah, there's a lot to be despairing about, but there's also so much to be hopeful. And I think working with youth is, is part of what really drives that hopefulness. So good to hear. And yes, that's such a good point. Um, I do think that when I look to the youth and some of the things that they are doing, I actually saw a video the other day, uh, as it is uh, Pride Month, as we are recording this, uh, that Chris Mosher shared of, oh, what was the school? I want to say it was Seattle Pacific. I may have that wrong though. Uh, I'll put, try and remember to put the video in the show notes. And it was showing how um, the uh, president or the university, this was Catholic university, um, was uh, very damaging in the way they were treating the LB yeah. LGBTQ+. Plus. Did you see this? I um, did see that. Community. And all the students handed out a flag on the stage. <laughs> right yeah. Yes. Yeah. Every I single thought that was so amazing. Not yeah, maybe what those on every student, but there was uh, all you see is this them just handing him a flag, he takes it, he puts it down. They had another one hands him a flag, he takes it, he puts it down. It was really cool. And you know, Chris uh, mentioned about how that gave him hope. And I very much felt the same way. I was like, yes, like you that you know, the the youth uh the you know, those generations coming up, that is what gives me a lot of hope. So thank you for that reminder to do that uh myself and for anyone listening. Yeah. I mean, I think I'm not a parent, so I don't have a day to day, but I, I feel like the way I see my friends raising their kids too, and how cognizant, like how they're teaching them to handle being angry and emotions or handle stress. Like, I think that piece is so beautiful. And it makes me like, just love my friends that much more because the humans that they're creating are so beautiful. So 
again, I hope I get to have that blessing someday. Um, but in the meantime, I really appreciate being able to do it with students. Yeah, it's it's funny you mention that because um, I primarily uh, talk to my daughter like every day, multiple times a day. We talk about Mother Earth and and she'll go into school and even her teacher wrote her a letter at the end of the year saying like, thank you for all you've taught me about Mother Earth. And I was like, yes, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing something if I'm like getting her to like rub off onto people and talking about, you know, taking care of, of the land and, um, you know, being respectful and doing what we can and, you know, uh, not trying to you know, kill bees, but just let them do what they're supposed to be doing, you know, leave them alone. Um, so, uh, yeah, that I will say as you know, you and I don't know each other that like that way yet, but it feels good to, um, have those wins where you hear that the messages you're trying so hard to put in are going in. Okay. Back to you though. Um, <laughs> let's go into, well, at first let's just Go over the, you mentioned about that 50 mile honor run that you did to honor those 50 scientists uh, dedicated to, and you dedicated that run to the scholars of the future. Uh, why choose a 50 mile run or why choose a run at all to do that? Yeah. Um, well, I think I chose the run because it was 2020 was really hard and it was kind of this, this celebration. I couldn't have a party with my friends, but you know, they often tease me that like my idea of fun is most people's idea of pain. And I was like, well, it just makes the most sense to like celebrate through running. And again, I, I think because of that particular area that I ran, I just started, I knew it so well mentally through reading, like and academically through reading all of these reports about it and reading these geological maps. Um, and then I knew about it, you know, spiritually through my own tribal teachings um, and understanding why this area was important, but I needed to know it physically, right? Um, and so being able to run adjacent to the mountain range and, and think about how it might be changing and how my own scholarship is really studying ways to heal that if it does change, but also how we can ensure that our voices are better represented in that scholarship and in, the, in those processes, that was really important to me. Um, so I think for, for me, it just felt like a really natural way to celebrate. Um, but also I think much like an ACA PhD, um, is very, I see so many parallels with ultra running and that like, you can't do it by yourself. You need a support team there. And so I had friends who showed up and helped support me at different phases. And sometimes I was crying and sometimes I was laughing and, um, and like, you know, them handing me water, reminding me to eat, like those are all pieces that you, a reminder that like you can't do either of these big things by yourself. You need that community. And so it, I couldn't have as many family members as I wanted to be there, but I could have friends who were, you know, boosted in there and able to show up and support and celebrate in that capacity. Mm, yeah, but what a beautiful way to do it and, and such an important message. And again, this is something you'll learn about when uh, those of you listening go watch uh, Run to Be Visible. You will get to see more about that in there and I'll leave that to uh to your curiosity to go check that out to learn more I want to finish up here by talking about this is something you mentioned to me before we start, started record, recording and that you mentioned just there that 2020 was really hard for all of us you know there's no denying that but you talked about your body changing ha and having patience with your body when you have this past self that you constantly reflect back to. I would love for you to, to talk a little bit about that as that is something I know many people are struggling with right now uh, because it just, there's a lot of stress that we've taken in over the last few years and uh, eating is sometimes something that we control or running is something that we can control, but um, it also isn't the, you know, the fix for what we're dealing with emotionally. Yeah, I mean, I think, I'm saying this as I'm here visiting my parents right now. And I was trying to put on some old running shorts and like, they just don't fit me anymore. And even though I feel like I'm running as much as I have all, all of my life, but recognizing just how my body is changing and, uh, it's just, it's hard to, to be an athlete and a woman and like not feel bad about yourself, um, because things don't fit the way they used to, or in running, like I'm not as fast as I used to be, even though like I eat better, sleep better now. And so I think I've definitely been just kind of processing a lot, processing a lot of that and, um, 
trying to have patience with myself, a friend of mine says, you have to remember that our bodies um, got us through the pandemic, right? Kept us healthy and alive. And so that's the part that we should celebrating, not like shaming our body for mm-hmm. um, not being the way it used to be. <laughs> but it's, it's still a practice of, of trying to have that self-patience and, and self-love. And and so I think I'm, I'm just kind of feeling that right now. Um, you know, I'm getting ready to run a, a 100K in November and kind of getting back into training. And I'm like, oh, I need some bigger bras. Like things are jiggling in ways I'm not used to, you know, but that's like inevitable. We're going to change. And so it's more about how we adapt to that change, right? And how we have patience with ourselves to that change. And so that's what the mind frame I'm trying to have in this space. But I'm just going to be honest, like I, like everyone else, I think I struggle with it too. Yeah, it's so difficult, isn't it? I mean, particularly after this time of the pandemic, uh, where or even especially right now being in the phase that we're in, like, are we in, are we out? What does the future look like? There's so much uncertainty in many ways, even more than, well, maybe not as much as at the very beginning, but there's still a lot of uncertainty as to what things look like. There's so much heaviness right now that um, just on our shoulders and in in the air, uh, you can feel it all the time. It's easy to get sucked up into it. Uh, that of course we are going to look for things that give us just that little bit of relief, even if it's for a moment. Um, and I think the fact that you are able to speak about that in a, in a, I want to say a healthy way, but the fact you said you're kind of going more off clothes fitting rather than I've gained seven pounds or whatever it might be, uh, because that helps us to see that you can be aware of the fact your body is changing without it being a big thing of, uh, I've got to change this right now. And then that takes you down an unhealthy path in probably a much worse way to where you are now letting it, uh, identify your life or dictate things. Um, and as we mentioned about, uh, embracing our bodies that are able to run, you're also then putting yourself at risk of not being able to do that one thing because you are, not giving your body a healthy space to to live and thrive. So thank you for talking about that. I really, really appreciate that. Yeah. My boyfriend says it's just an opportunity to go buy new running clothes. And so when he shapes <sighs> it like that, I'm like, yeah, you're right. <laughs> That's great. So. Yes. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, well, uh, when I, when I left, uh, the elite world in 2016, I, um, I had to put all my stuff, all my previous clothes into a suitcase and just like shut them away because I knew, uh, that, that my body was going to totally change. And, uh, it was quite a nice feeling to be able to just be like, okay, well, uh, I guess we get to pick some new things that are going to fit this body shape and, and try new styles and things like that. So, um, as long as we, l- uh, look after and take care of our new clothes, then, um, you know, that's, uh, a yeah, little exactly. side benefit. Yeah. Okay. So is there anything else you want to tell to the community, uh, who might be listening to this or the, the listeners who have really been enjoying what you're saying, but yeah, any final message you would like to remind them about based on your career or, uh, your running or just anything really? Yeah. I mean, so many things it's hard, but I think (laughs) one, one that I just want to bring attention to is, um, myself and two other soil scientists. We did a 135 mile run in September. Um, for a project called We'll Run for Soil, with a specific intention of really wanting to help the public think about the ecosystems in which we run with. Um, so not, and I say with, not on, because we're part of that ecosystem, right? Yep. Um, and part of it is like, we did this really long, we did it over six days. Um, and, and part of what we were talking about is not only the soils that we see, but also our identity as soil scientists in this very male dominated field. Yeah. Um, and you know, we weren't going for the fastest known time. We were rather slow. And like, I remember telling people I'm doing 135 mile and they're like, Oh, over six days. Like that sounds very luxurious. But part of that process was that we are going to soil scientist pace. And so we are not going fast, but we are sitting there and observing the ecosystems in which we're interacting. And so I just want to bring that because if you're interested in soils and how they play in climate issues, or even just like this appreciation for soils more than something that grows our food. Um, that's what this film is going to be about. And so we filmed it oh, cool. um, and that'll be, we're working on the edits right now. So that'll be coming out hopefully in 2023. 
Um, so that's what definitely some name of the scientists. Oh, so the project itself is called Will Run for Soil. Um, and it's with Yamina, Dr. Yamina Pressler and Dr. Karen Vaughn. Um, okay. And so that will be something that's kind of coming out on the horizon. Yes. And what was the other thing? Um, well, then I was just going to mention like with the, the Boston Marathon and running to increase awareness about land back. That was what, what I really yeah. what I dedicated the Boston Marathon to. And so if you're interested in learning more about that, I have a very long Twitter thread on my website or on Twitter um, that kind of talks about why that movement is important and thinking about how we address future climate issues. Um, and so those are both kind of running with the educational pieces to them. Yes, definitely. Sorry, we should have we should have mentioned that. Tell, go ahead and tell us a little bit about land back. Uh, you know, I think that's important to to share. Yeah, gen like generally speaking, the land back movement is about um, refostering these relationships with ecosystems, and part of that refostering is that native people having the right and abilities to be able to manage their own ecosystems in ways that they have historically been um, disenfranchised from doing so, and so. There's this land back movement of this movement to for native people to get their land back to be able to manage it in the capacity that is culturally appropriate. And so we talk about this a lot. We talked a little bit earlier about resiliency in terms of ecosystems. Well, this is a really big piece of that, that resiliency in ecosystems. And so what I, I wanted to highlight land back because I think people hear that and a lot of people think, oh, like the native people are going to take all the land away from us. And that's yeah. actually not what the case is, even though that ancestrally is our traditional homelands and lands. A lot of the land back movement is actually, you know, land trusts partnering with tribal nations to return the land or private owners returning their land back to a tribal nation um, or, or companies that have recognized, you know, how they obtained that land was um, really unscrupulous and are returning. Even churches are returning land back to the tribal nations to be able to manage it. And what's really beautiful in that process is that you see this resurgence of language. So many of the pieces of land that come back are like, oh, these are the place that like of where our ancestors came from, or, you know, that we are the water people. And now we have this parcel of land back that allows our tribal nation to have access to the water in a way that we never historically had. Or even one example of the Loni tribe, um, the, the, the Esalen tribe, excuse me, of the Big Sur, California. So all, for all of your runners, think about doing the Big Sur Marathon. Well, the tribe that's from that area, they were kicked off their land um, by a lot of ranchers and have never actually held title to their own whole traditional homelands. And so they've been this landless tribe for 200 plus years, I, mean, I think longer than that. And so um, in 20... 21, it was that they actually were granted something like 12,000 acres to actually have a homeland for the first time. And so when you have access to the land, you have access to your language or re re resurgence of your language, of your tra traditions, of your foods, of your medicines. Like there's so much knowledge and we think about resiliency that's going to be coming back as a result of land back. So I wanted to highlight land back in these really positive capacities, not necessarily in people think this fear-based Capacity. That is often, yeah. um, I think, the case in the media. Yes, thank you so much for sharing that. I will put a link in the show notes uh, and make sure that, uh, you know, encourage people to go check that out, uh, all the links we've talked about today. Lydia, thank you so much for sharing with us today. I've really loved getting to know you and I'm sure the listeners have too and uh, look forward to seeing uh, the next movie when it comes out and uh, following along with uh, your career in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure to be here. Hi friends, just a quick message to say a big thank you to the Running For Real team. While I may be the face of Running For Real and the voice behind the podcast, there are a group of people who are working tirelessly to provide everything that runners could need within our community to make our community stronger, better and evolve and grow and learn from one another. We are working really hard to make Running For Real the place we believe it can be within our community. I just want to take a moment to thank everyone on our team. That is Victoria, Stacy, Sandy, Sally, Maria, Kelsey, Kat, Jeremy, and Erica. I appreciate each and every one of you and the hard work that you put in. Now let's get back to the show.
I really appreciated that conversation with Lydia and getting to know her more about her career, the things that she educated us on and how she tied it all together. I thought she did that absolutely beautifully. I really enjoyed listening and learning and paying attention to that. There will be lots of uh, notes and links in the show notes for you to go check out. You can go to runningforreal.com forward slash episode 307. That's runningforreal.com forward slash episode 307. You can also find links to our sponsors in there. Allbirds, thank you for sponsoring this episode. Go to allbirds.com. Go check out those tree flyers I've been raving about. Uh, You will see why I love them so much once you get yourself a pair. I also want to uh, direct you towards the Legacy of Speed podcast that was mentioned in this episode. I am loving the episodes. They are so good. Uh, So go check that out wherever you find your podcast. There's also a link in the show notes. And also thank you to Paceline for offering us that uh, credit card that gives us 5% back on health and wellness purchases simply by logging 150 minutes a week. It is absolutely fantastic. And I just think it's such a good idea. So you can go to pacelinefit.app.link forward slash Tina, or you can just go to the link in the show notes. It'll be nice and easy for you to go get it. Thanks so much for listening, friends. I will see you next week. Thank you.